From Microbe TV, this is Office Hours for September 27, 2023. Hello, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and welcome to all of you virophiles, people who are interested in viruses, to our Wednesday evening discussions. And I want to thank our moderators before we get started. Let's see who's here. Frank is here. Two Wednesdays in a row. Thank you so much, Frank. And who else did I see? Tom. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for joining us. And, uh, yeah, we can probably get by with two moderators. We have a, a modest, civilized crowd tonight, uh, which which brings up the question, should we do this every week or every other week? Or should we do it every week for just an hour? Or should we just do it every week for two hours? Tell me in the chat what you want to do. Okay, what do I have for you here? <clears throat> do I have a picture? Yes. But first, let me, let's see who's here. I like to welcome people. All right. Um, here's Frank. Frank's our, one of our moderators. You can tell who the moderators are. They have a blue wrench, which I think is pretty classy. I like that blue wrench. And my voice is a little scratchy because, why? Um, I did a lot of talking today. <laughs> I did two hours of recording and uh, an hour and a half of uh, Tuivo live stream. And so, there you go. Uh, Elizabeth is in West Virginia. Uh, Tom, where are you? Are you in Oregon or are you in Wisconsin? Let's see who else is here, who tells us uh, where they are from. <laughs> I know John is from Minnesota and Desiree. Hey, Desiree is in the house. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, Laguna Beach, California. Desiree has some some interesting ideas, which we'll, we'll come to in a moment. Mm, I think I know that, yes, Patricia is in D.C., she says it's been lovely. So here in uh, New York, New York area, um, it rained from Saturday to yesterday. Today was the first sunny day. And I have to say, I have to say, I don't like it when it rains for four days. I get a little melancholy, okay? Yeah, even Vincent Racaniello gets, gets melancholy, even though he's always excited by viruses. They perk him up when it rains for four days. Even the viruses have a hard time. Boulder, Colorado. Changsha, China, where I will be going in a couple of weeks. Montreal, where I'll be going in a couple of weeks. And the Changsha is more than a couple of weeks. Um, South Jersey. <laughs> and then we'll get to the other. Ooh, Ecuador. Welcome. Welcome. Longmont, Colorado. Here we have Claire in the UK. White Plains, New York. Tom's in the coastal range of Oregon. Okay. Charlotte, hello from South Florida. I hear you're going to Israel. Go for it. Daryl is from Virginia Beach. Uh, Lori in Pueblo, Colorado. Kang is in Chicago. Peter is in Winona, Minnesota. Tomball, Texas. I got it, Lori. <laughs> I remembered from this afternoon. Tomball, Texas, Colorado. Yeah, I, yeah, you had Colorado, but I got it. I think I said Colorado. You've been listening since 2020 every week, Las Vegas. Thank you, Linda. We really appreciate it. Patty's in coastal New Hampshire, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, where I have been, Long Island, where I have certainly been, hmm. Ontario, Canada. Uh, <laughs> Carol, our resident nephrologist from Southern California. Oh, look at this. It's 83 degrees. I think Desiree, she, she's also... Uh, in 79-ish or something like that, right? Oh, my gosh. These people who are in the warm weather. It's just too much. Uh, no one does sadness like Italians. Is that true? 
oh my gosh, maybe that's what, what I'm, a, maybe that's it. My, you know, I'm 80, 90% Italian by uh, 23 and me. That could do it. <clears throat> I, I get cheered up when I go to the incubator. <laughs> Margot from Phoenix, but currently in Portland, following a band. Ooh, from Seattle to Portland, San Francisco, and Hollywood, and then back to Phoenix. Would you follow Twiv? Probably not. What if Twiv, Twiv did a U.S. tour? Would you follow it? Nope. I know you wouldn't. You'd go to one city. That's fine. I don't, you know, we're not a rock band. Bruno is from Tempe, Arizona. Hat is L.A. Nebby is in Central Florida. Patricia from Northern Virginia. Patricia was on Twivo live stream today, also with some others. Uh, wh when, where in Montreal? I'll tell you right now. I'm going to McGill, McGill University. And uh, let's see, calendar time. Uh, Mont Royal, where the heck is Montreal? It's, it's the end of what? September? No. Sorry. Come on. Is it? Sorry to be staring the other way. I'm looking for Montreal. Here it is. I'll be arriving on October 31st, Halloween. And I will be departing on Thursday the 2nd. And we do a TWIV at 9.30 in the morning on Wednesday, November 1st. So if, if you think you might want to meet up, uh, just send me an email, vincent at microbe.tv. That goes for any of the places. So I'll be in, in Boston in two weeks, uh, but only for one night at ID week. And then the week after I'll be at um, Chicago for ASTMH for a couple of days. So that's a better, that's a better target there. Mike is from Toronto. Rima and Luna from Iowa, Santa Rosa, California, mm, Louisville, Kentucky. I love the distribution of everybody. Thank you so much. Mike and Lori are in Seattle. There you go. Uh, Desiree would like to be in Seattle. She misses it. Uh, 16C. Wow. It's pretty chilly. And Neva, hello, Neva. Buda, Tex Buda, Texas. Welcome, everybody. Okay, I'm going to go back to the start because there were a couple of things. First of all, uh, I want to show you a picture. So this is this the uh, incubator, of course. And it's the part where I do one-on-one -on -one interviews. So you can see, you know, we got a background, which is... Uh, sound dampening, but it's in the shape of uh, pentagons, which is the closest we could get to viruses. Not a big fan of the colors, especially they don't go well with the red and the green on the side. We might paint them, but not now. Anyway, we have two chairs and a table, and then you can see we do a two-camera shoot. One camera gets both people, and then the other one gets the guest, so we can edit back and forth. So today, we recorded an episode of... Um, a new podcast that's going to be called The Sickening <laughs> Virology for Regular People. And then yesterday I did an interview with Kevin Messicar, who was a pediatric infectious disease doctor at the University of Colorado in Denver. And we talked about AFM, acute flaccid myelitis and enterovirus D68. And then, um, let's see, last week or two weeks ago, we did, uh, I interviewed Dixon on his new book, the New City, which is coming out, I think, late October. And we'll be releasing that as soon as we can get it edited. So that happens here. I kind of like this space. Um, you know, we're still working out how to do everything efficiently. But this is where I like to have one-on-one. -on -one. And then, you know, if Malcolm Gladwell comes, which he said he would, I would interview him here and a couple of other people. So as people come to New York, the idea is to get them here in this red seat <laughs> and and interview them. So if you visit the incubator, which you're welcome to do, you can sit in these chairs. They're very comfortable, by the way. 
All right, so that's one thing. And the other thing is very cool. I got so so uh oh, Vanity Nutrition is in the house. Thank you for coming. And um <laughs> And uh, moderating, yeah, does, do those things remind you of Orgo? Yeah, <laughs> I would guess they would. Uh, they were hexagons? Hold on, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, you're right. I, I'm blind or stupid for both. Okay, uh, Mark Martin had some, some uh, pins made, right? These are pins that you, you put for your clothing. And look at this. This is pretty cool. So this is by a company in the UK called, called Heartful. Heartful.co.uk. Uh, and they came over yesterday from the UK. So these are glow in the dark. Let's see if we turn the light off. If they glow, we'll do an experiment. Now, I guess they need to have some light shined on them. But anyway, that's microbe TV. That's a hashtag microbe TV. And then we have a regular microbe TV. That's cool. And then we, this is a good one. <laughs> and we have Virocentric. And then we have uh, Mark's podcast, Matters Microbial, hashtag, right? And then we have the Podfather Supreme. So so Mark likes to call me the Podfather Supreme. Uh, so years ago, you know, the, the rumor is that Adam Carolla invented the podcast, or he did the first popular podcast. So he was called the Pod Father, right? And so he Mark now adds Supreme to me to distinguish me from Adam Carolla. But Adam is much more famous than I am. But I do know more viruses than he does. So that's that, right? That's good. All right, we'll get we'll do some chatting here, uh, and uh, we could also do some Amy papers. There's some new ones there. Um, but we'll we'll look at some of your comments first. Um, so Linda still has COVID. How long can you keep getting positive tests? Yeah, some people have them for many days. Um, you know they're not they're not really uh, indicative of infectious virus. Just viral proteins sticking around. They can stick around a long time. So New York Corn says his wife tested positive for twelve days. So you know what's happening is uh, well you know. Lymph nodes hold antigen. That's their job. <laughs> they hold it there for a long time so that the, uh, the you can do affinity maturation. You can select for more higher affinity antibodies. And so the protein remains in the in the uh, sp in specific places in the lymph node. So it could break off and fall out and end up in in your nose and you swab it and you're positive. Anyway, I'm not I'm not surprised and I'm not concerned about it. It's not infectious virus. Um, yes, I, I do like the sun because um, I have Mediterranean blood. I don't really like cold weather. But unfortunately, we're going into the winter here in the Northeast, and I'm probably stuck here for, you know, I didn't want to say forever. Who knows? You never know what's going to happen, right? I could end up relocating to a sunnier climate. Hey, maybe we could move the incubator to the West Coast for its the second part of its existence. Who knows? It doesn't have to be in any one place, right? But New York is a central place. That's cool. So here, Desiree. <laughs> Vincent, so when can we expect to see your COVID booster video? And I would love to see a 2024 calendar of you. And, she, and Desiree would like me to wear a different pair of colored glasses each month. Okay, so... I can wear a different pair of colored glasses and I'll, I'll wear something different. You know, I get it properly photographed. Uh, I'm happy to make a calendar, but if, you know, who's going to buy this besides Desiree? Um, maybe you want uh, a calendar with the different Twiv hosts, not just me, right? Let's see, how many podcasts do we have? We have like eight. So that would be eight months. And then you could have a couple of bonus months uh, of me. And, of course, we'd sell it for uh, for fundraising, right? That um, would be cool. So that's a good idea. Uh, as for the, the COVID uh, booster video, as you know, Desiree is you know, doing a COVID <laughs> vaccination challenge, right? Remember the ALS challenge where you poured an ice bucket over your head? Well, you don't have to do that for this. Um, Although I did it for, for ALS. I thought that was cool. Rich Condit challenged me because he did it. 
uh, you just have to make a video. What, what is it, Desiree? You have to show yourself getting the injection or, or something like that. Um, I can. Do, I don't know if I'm going to show it getting the injection, but I will make a video and talk about who should get it, in my opinion. Okay, which is fine. Uh, and then I would be happy to make a calendar. That's a great idea. So uh, <laughs> thank you for suggesting it. Okie dokie. Sarah Dong is back on PussCast. Yes, I, I like having uh, someone opposite Daniel. You know, that really works. Um, that really works. Uh, it's good to have someone opposite Daniel. Let's just put it that way, whether it's me or, or um, <laughs> Sarah, but it's good. Yeah, and Frank says each month Vincent could be dressed as a different virus. You know, I, they do have virus costumes, right? Um, here, I'll show you. <laughs> Let's see how many they have, right? <laughs> Look at this. This is pretty funny. Oh, my gosh. We'll do a screen share here, okay? <laughs> Virus costumes. Of course, they're all coronaviruses, right? Yeah, this COVID germ. Oh, my gosh. You know, that there are not that many. Let's look at the images. And now we have uh, some other ones. But they're all, they're all coronaviruses, right? Pretty much. I mean, they're different colors and so forth. But I don't know if I could fill 12 months unless someone made them. Right. So, but they're all, you know, around virus in your middle area there. But anyway, it's a good idea. We'll see. I'm not sure we can do that. Okie dokie. What else do we have? All right. <clears throat> uh, I just read an all to expect a news story that four children in Idaho have measles all unvaccinated, all in the same household. In August, Idaho kindergarten had 10% exemptions, which is too high. Yeah, so four unimmunized children, not surprising, all in the same household, not surprising. Where did the virus come from? Yeah, that's a good question. Someone brought it in, obviously. Could have been one of the kids, could have been one of the parents, who knows. But these are preventable, right? And these kids... Uh, you know, encephalitis is one in a thousand, so one of those kids could get encephalitis. But more seriously, you know, even if they recover, uh, one in 10,000 kids in 10 to 20 years will develop subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a progressive neurological degenerative disease. So basically, they lose neurological function, cognitive and motor, and 100% fatal. Nothing you can do about it. And so... Yeah, you want to risk giving that, having your kid get that? I know one in 10,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but it could be you. So don't do it. Vaccinate your kid. Mm. Lori, in an upcoming TWIF, could you look at the paper in Nature Immunology, the SARS CoV 2 reservoir, potential driver of inflammation and other disease? mechanisms in long COVID, please. Okay, we're doing one tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow, Friday on TWIV, a long COVID paper. Um, so we're now doing, and this is the second week in a row, and this one is uh, from Akiko Iwasaki's lab. I'll, I'll show you the paper. Distinguishing features of long COVID identified through immune profiling. So, I don't think, no, this is nature, not nature immunology. So, you know, they looked at various immune markers and try and find things that correlate with long COVID, right? And and I think that's a bit of a difficulty because long COVID is not one disease. So, I'm not sure one thing is going to track with it or even a couple of things, right? If there are 20 different organ systems that can be affected, well, not 20 different, but things happening in 20 different ways in various organ systems, I'm not sure that you're going to get it. And that might make the analysis very noisy. So anyway, we're going to do this on Friday. We'll have the wisdom of the uh, entire crew. But anyway, this one, Lori, um, 
if you could email it to me, it would be helpful. Vincent at microbe.tv. That way I'll remember it. Otherwise, I tend to forget. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so now, um, how often do you want this? So every week for an hour, every week for an hour, every week, every week, um, every week for an hour. Okay, so we're we're looking at an hour every week, every week. So okay, every week is clear for an hour at least. Every week for an hour, every week for an hour. So it looks like most people want every week for an hour. So here's what I'll do. I'll keep answering your questions until there are no more left. And if we if it has to go over an hour, that's fine, because we're already at 820, right? We're 20 minutes in. And if we're done at an hour, we stop. And if we need to go more, we go. Okay, how's that? Um, I'm happy to go for two hours, but if most people don't want two hours, I guess it's, it's 10, 12 people who said that. But... Um, We'll see how it goes. We'll play it by ear. But everyone wants it every week, so that's good. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be traveling. So let's see. Next week, next week we'll be here. Uh, the following week, uh, I'll be in Boston, so mm, probably no office hours. And the following week, I'll be in Chicago, so probably two weeks in a row. Maybe I have to do one of those on the road. Then the 25th, we're on. The, the Wednesday, November 1st, I'll be at McGill. And then Wednesday, November 8th, I'll be in Hong Kong for two Wednesdays. So we'll miss a couple in the next weeks. Okay, so John writes, I saw two news stories blaming Molnupiravir for variants. I think that some voting for the UA originally had those reservations in the 13 to 10 vote. Is this correct and doesn't matter? So what, what they found is we know what kinds of... Uh, mutations in the genome are caused by molnupiravir. So just to remind everyone, molnupiravir is an antiviral for SARS-CoV-2. Its target is the RNA polymerase, the enzyme that makes copies of the viral genome and makes mRNAs together with other proteins. But what molnupiravir does, it makes the enzyme, the RNA polymerase, make mistakes, another word for mutations. And it makes certain kinds of mutations. So it has a mutational signature. You can tell uh, viruses that have been propagated in the presence of molnupiravir, they have certain kinds of mutations. And so what they have done is looked in uh, databases of sequences from SARS-CoV-2, from COVID patients, and they find uh, signatures of molnupiravir mutation. It doesn't mean they're making the variants of concern or the Omicron lineages and that sort of thing, right? That, that's not what they're saying. They're just saying that there's a signature. So it's having an effect. It's, it's these viruses that are being mutated by molnupiravir. I mean, the idea is that molnupiravir mutates the virus so it can't, it's no longer infectious, but that doesn't happen all the time. And some of those viruses reproduce and they get out and they circulate. There's no evidence that that is a problem. So far, I mean, it could change, right, in the future. But so far, there's no evidence uh, that this is a problem. So I would say we keep looking and paying attention, but not to worry at this point. But it's not really to correct it. Well, it depends what you mean by variant, right? Uh, Jens Kuhn has a very specific definition of variant, which is different from mine. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a lineage with, with certain changes. But I think a variant is anything comes out of two people that's different but hey what do i know anyway it's just two viruses that differ in a certain way with mutations now there are there are variants of concern that seem to be immune evasive right and and dominate and out place out replicate other variants of SARS-CoV-2 and then there are variants that well every person is shedding variants right so the, the point here is that molnupiravir makes a signature of mutation, and you can detect that in the wild. And I don't think it's not resistance to molnupiravir. It's not um, <clears throat> causing any antigenic change. It's not causing any fitness change as far as we know, but we should keep an eye on it for sure. So, so it's an example of the press not quite getting it right, right? All right, a recent study used as evidence of persistent virus in the body 
uh, strand-specific RT-PCR for detection of replicating SARS-CoV-2. Um, well, you can get minus strands. Yeah, so, so the idea is that if you're getting a minus strand, um, it's by polymerase copying the plus strand. Uh, you know, of course, it depends on whether the the PCR has been designed properly, and it can be, but that's a concern there. Um, but also, you can imagine that some, you know, it, it did replicate at some point, and then it stopped. And, but if the tissue is still harboring some negative or minus strand RNA, the complement of the pro plus strand, so I don't, it it indicates replication at some point close to or previous to the assay when the sample was taken. It doesn't prove that there's ongoing replication. It could, could just be a reservoir of minus strand RNA. Uh, so it doesn't indicate pers persistent virus means the production of infectious virus. When we talk about persistent viral infections, we talk about viruses that at for, for your whole life, there's a period when they are reproducing and making infectious virus. And so... Some viruses reproduce continuously. The polyomaviruses that are in all of us, they reproduce continuously. They're from moderate to high levels of virus in us. And in contrast, the latent viruses like herpes viruses, there are periods when you can't find any infectious virus, then there are bursts of infectious virus production, then none. And during the burst, you can detect infectious virus and the people shed them. So... Whether or not that's happening here, you have to measure infectious virus. Negative strand PCR simply isn't enough. You have to say, is there infectious virus here? And if so, how much? Is there one PFU? Is, is there, are there 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000? What is it? You have to quantify. It's not easy. But this is not valid for saying that you have replicating SARS-CoV-2 at the time of, of sampling because it might not be. I hope I explained that. It was a long time. <laughs> Sorry about that. My entire family recently caught COVID and RSV. We are all vaccinated. My son had two doses. Should he get a third shot? And should my wife get her fourth shot? So, uh, do you have symptomatic COVID? Was it mild, moderate, serious? Or was it just a positive test? I would say that since you just had an infection, uh, you don't need a third shot as of yet. You should, if you wanted to get one, you could, but you should wait a couple of months uh, to to get that. Um, you know, I got three shots and an infection, and I think that's great immun immunity. Uh, looking forward, it protects you well. So I would say, yeah, at some point, you get a third shot, and your son will get the new. Um, vaccine, XBB.1.5, so that would be cool. Should your wife get her third shot? So your wife now has three shots and an infection. So if she's healthy and young, I would say it's not needed. That's what Paul Offit says. Okay, so I'm not a, I'm not giving medical advice. I'm quoting Paul Offit, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that three ancestral doses and an infection are good for protection against severe disease and death in most people, unless you're over 75 and have comorbidities and so forth. So, you know, beyond the noise, we, we go into all of that. Mm. Could muscle cells have gotten their syncytial proteins from viruses like the placental did? Hmm. I've never heard anyone uh, talk about that. They are, the cardio, cardiac muscle fibers are syncytia of individual cells, cardiomyocytes joined end to end. So muscle syncytia, did it come <laughs> from a retrovirus? And I don't think there's any evidence that it did. Uh, but, you know, in, in the... Um, Placenta, we do have evidence for that. But I'm not aware of any evidence for uh, muscle cells being generated. But it's a good question. Huh. 
Yeah, the placenta is great evidence, syncytium capture, but I'm not aware of any, any for muscle cells, but good question. Good question. I heard, that, I saw that Paxlovid is not as effective as it used to be. Reported in JAMA this week. Well, <laughs> well, there are other options, right? You can get remdesivir, uh, which is which is good, and then molnupiravir, which is not as good. Thirty percent effective at reducing progression to hospitalization, and remdesivir and, and Paxlovid are both high, eighties, nineties. So, you know, you have to be careful of a study of a single study. Um, I haven't seen this one, but you know, Daniel has been reporting. Uh, 80 to 90 percent effective. So I don't know why it would be declining because there's no um, there's no evidence for resistance. No, I, I'm not finding that article. So maybe you could send it to me, Rach. You have my email. I think um, my, you know maybe Daniel will talk about this. Send me the article, and I'll put it on the agenda for Daniel. We record tomorrow. So I'll ask him what he thinks. <laughs> and a lot of people want every week for an hour. But as I said, we will see what we have at an hour. And if... Uh, if we're, th if we're through with the questions, um, I will stop. But if there are more, I'll keep going past an hour up to two hours. How's that? You know, I have to remember once, I don't know how long ago it was, I went for a third hour, and people really liked that. It was a big surprise, right? It was cool. Hexagons. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not paying attention. Sometimes I just, you know, do it. Cyclohexane. Yep. <laughs> Buda, Texas. I, I pronounce it because uh, Buda has written in multiple times to, not Buda, Neva from Buda <laughs> has written in multiple times. She taught us how to pronounce it. And, you know, she's gone to lunch with Rich Condit, so she taught him too. And so, yeah, I I, I get it. We, we've said it a, a number of times. Looks like the negative black space is maybe an outline of a virus. What are you, are you talking about this? This microphone cover? Hmm. Could be, right? But it's not. It's not. I do have some viruses here. Let's see what they look like. So this is... Um, this is a Christmas <laughs> ornament that someone gave me. <laughs> uh, it's TWIV with one receptor protein bound. Sorry, it's poliovirus with one receptor protein, and it has a TWIV logo. Uh, and this, of course, is a giant microbes. This is supposed to be influenza virus, you know, the filamentous form of influenza. I like this one. This is um, 3D printed by Mark Martin, of course, SARS-CoV-2. And I like this a lot because it flashes. Watch. Watch this. Uh, we're going to turn it on, and then we'll turn the light off. I know, toys, right? Isn't that cool? Mark Martin, thank you very much. Mark, is uh, he likes his toys. It's a lovely phage, though, isn't it? It's 3D printed, and he put some lights in it. It's beautiful. Love it. So, so isn't it cool? You have the icosahedral head, and that's where the DNA is, right? It's right in there. And then you have a helical tail fiber, and then the uh, a helical tail, and then tail fibers. And the DNA comes out of the head and shoots out from the base into the bacterium. And usually there's a, there's a spike down here that makes a hole in the bacterium, and the spike falls away, and then out comes... The, the DNA, like the, like the the wire that has the light on it. They're great things. Uh, these models to um, 
explain stuff with, right? Uh, Jessica, hello from Toledo, Ohio. I listened to Twiv Immune with Ellen Rothenberg. Absolutely fantastic, inspiring. Yes, she's wonderful. And this is what I feel our mission is, to talk to people who uh, have interesting careers and let you hear it, right? We, we, we know the people who are um, doing cool work. And, you know, with me and my colleagues, we identify them, we record. Nobody else is going to do that, right? Consistently, week after week, nobody's going to do it. That's why we need your support, all right? And you can go to Venmo here and help us out if you'd like, or you can go to uh, do the super chat below the window, or you can uh, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And, you know, I hate to beg for money all the time, but... Um, we don't. We can't do this without your support, right? If we have no money, then there's no incubator, and I, you know, I can do a cottage thing here, but I don't really want to do that. I can't make bring people here in my basement and interview them. I want to keep the incubator. You guys can visit. We can have people come there. We can do high quality productions. We can do more of them. It's just an unprecedented thing that nobody's doing, and. I'm excited to do it for you and interviews like this or what we can do. Of course, we went up to Cornell for that. And that's the other thing we can do when we have something happening somewhere. We could travel and go. We have funds from your donations to uh, to travel and, and talk to me. I do think in-person interviews are great. Please invite Francis Collins. Yeah, Francis would be interesting. And uh, I will write that down. I don't. I didn't bring my field notes today, but I'll write down Francis Collins with an I. Okay. Uh, yeah, I bet he would do it. Yeah, I know. They wouldn't pack so well if they were pentagons. Pentagons are what viruses have. Here, let me see if I have one. No, I don't have a pentagon, but uh, you know, fivefold axes, pentamers on on icosahedral viruses are like basically pentagons, right? Uh, what don't you see in the micro TV store, Desiree? What are you t What are you talking about? There's th some things that are missing. I have to put in, but just tell me what it is. Yeah, Mark Martin is a great addition. I, I like his programs. Um, and, um, I think he's doing a great job. He has great guests, right? Really interesting guests. Really good. I knew he would be good. I've known him for many years. And I said, when you're ready to do your podcast, come to Microbe TV. We'll take care of you. And he did. Okay, Kang, would the definition of infection need to include the distinctions between mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism? Okay, so this is a good question. What does infection mean? And I think it means something different in a cell versus, um, say, a host organism. And I have... Um, still working on a definition but i think uh in in a cell in culture the gene the virus has to get into the cell um and start replicating do we need infectious virus well you could have different kinds of infection you could have productive infection which would be making infectious virus you could have abortive infection where the genome gets in and it doesn't go any further. You don't get infectious particles. So that's one way of overcoming it. The problem, you give it productive infection and abortive infection. And then in a host, you know, if, if you swallow some virus and it passes through you, is that infection? No, I don't think that is. I think it has to get into a cell. And so... <clears throat> 
if you uh, if if you get infected, it means the virus is getting into your cell, and could be. I think it could be a productive infection and or an abortive infection, but we don't usually study those in people. So I would say in people, it's just a matter of the genome uh, getting into the cell, and that would be infection. Yeah, I don't think you need to include uh, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism in in the definition. No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, of course. <sighs> You know what? Uh, let's. I recently defined all those, so let me let me find my definition so that we can um, so that we can be on the same page. Which, of course, I'm not going to be able to find it. <laughs> uh, I had these these. Uh, words of the week and I, and I had a really nice definition of parasitism. Let me try and go to my Instagram and see if that last one here, uh, that's parasite. And then after that I had another word of the week. Where is it? Oh dear. It's not here. Maybe I never published it. You know, parasite is an organism that lives on or in a different host and causes harm. Different host species and causes harm by taking nutrients or other resources. Ticks, tapeworms, viruses, bacteria, or parasites. A parasitic relationship is a type of symbiosis, which is the interaction of different species that live on or near one another. Other symbioses include mutualism, where both species benefit, and commensalism, where one species benefits, the other is neither harm nor help. There you go. I'm going to put this up, okay, because this is a good... <laughs> This is a good definition. Here we go. A parasite, organism that lives on or in a different host, causes harm. Um, a, a parasitic relationship is a type of symbiosis where that's an interaction between different species that live on or in each, each other, on or near each other. Other symbioses include mutualism, where both species benefit, and commensalism, one benefits, the other is neither harm nor help. So there is a great definition all in one place. That's over on my Instagram channel. You do follow me on Instagram, right, folks? You should. Little good gems of stuff get put there. Thank you for the question. Uh, so anyway, I hope I explained that. <laughs> Mark was teaching his class about bioluminescence. Yeah, I think that he makes a lot of these glow-in-the-dark things. And, um, th th you know, he likes bioluminescence, and so he makes glowy things for sure. Yep. Hello, Alina from Coxsackie, New York. <laughs> I still have your, I got the, the microscope is right here. I'm really um, bad at packing it up, but since it's here right next to my desk, I see it a lot. And one of these days I'll pack it up. You bet. Uh, Daniel recommended if I test positive for COVID, stop testing. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, you probably have to stop testing and then you know, if you if you take back Slovid, you'll feel better and so forth. You don't have to keep testing on and on. Yeah. Peter says, I just tested positive, got back Slovid, then had two days negative, two days later positive again. Yeah. So as Dan and Daniel answered this question last week, someone had the same situation. And Daniel said, um, you know, they're... Uh, the, the, you feel better, and, and there's, but there's still virus in you. And, you know, maybe a little bolus has been released from your mucous membranes, and when you did the swabbing, it picked it up, right? So it doesn't all go away overnight. And so some some particles may be coming out. It may not be replicating anymore, but some particles are sequestered and they come out again. So don't worry about that positive test much later. That's why Daniel <laughs> said to Laurie, stop testing. <laughs> Once you test, you take your Paxlovid, that's it. Come to Cali. For what? For, for a TWIV? Yeah, we'll be there for a TWIV. Oh, and Peter says, and this time I feel worse. Well, it's not Paxlovid rebound. It is a the inflammatory phase of COVID. Okay, So if you didn't take Paxlovid, you'd have the same thing. It's just that you're taking Paxlovid and 
you get this and you say, oh, it must be Paxlovid rebound. But in a natural infection, you have, you know, seven to 10 days of viral production. It peaks and goes down. And then if you if you're taking Paxlovid early in that rising part of the peak, Paxlovid will inhibit virus production. But then you have an inflammatory phase. In some people, you have lots of cytokines being produced and extensive inflammation. You feel bad from that. And that's a separate phase that doesn't involve virus production anymore. So, you know, the, the Paxlovid is only five days. And so, you know, at seven to 10 to 14 days, you can have this inflammatory phase and people call it Paxlovid rebound because it happens after you take rebound, Paxlovid, but it's not caused by Paxlovid because it happens even if you don't take it. It's really hard to convince people it's not Paxlovid rebound, despite the fact that there are many papers published that show in controlled studies of people with and without Paxlovid, you still have the same rebound, which is not really rebound. It's just the second phase of the infection, the inflammatory phase. So uh, we are not going to get away from it. I, mean, I went to my doc last week and, you know, he said, yeah, re Paxlovid rebound is a thing, but it's rare. I mean, I'm not going to argue with him. What's the point? Um, what's the point? <laughs> Daniel says it every week, and he still can't get through to a lot of people. All right, so Patricia, here we go. New York Times article about Paxlovid rebound featuring Michael Minna saying you take precautions if you test positive after infection, sort of the opposite of what Daniel says. Yeah, you know, every expert <laughs> has their own opinion. I, I think Daniel's right. It's not a rebound. It's not an increase in infectious virus. The viral phase has already gone down. So uh, that's Michael's opinion. Uh, and so, you know, uh, there's no Paxlovid rebound. It's a feature of the natural infection. Now, taking precautions, if you test positive, that's an interesting question. So studies have been done, and some people in that inflammatory phase do shed infectious virus. Not everyone. The question is whether they shed enough to infect other people. And that simply hasn't been addressed. So if you want to say, if I'm shedding any virus, we're going to um, make you stay home. Okay, you can do that. But I don't think that's necessary. Okie dokie. Hosts of Twiv and their cat's calendar. <laughs> I don't have a cat. It just could be me. Uh, yes, yeah, so New York saw that article. was a little disappointed. Lots of people in the comments talking about how they wouldn't take Paxlovid again. Yeah, that's wrong. Because if they don't, they could die. And see, this is irresponsible journalism. But it depends who they talk to. So... They talk to Michael Minna, you get that uh, uh, angle. If you talk to Daniel Griffin, you get another angle. So what's the solution? You have both and you say experts are divided. But I don't think there's any division because if Michael looked at the paper, he would see that in that study, with and without Paxlovid, you still had an inflammatory phase. So this is very frustrating, yeah. New York Times should know better. But I will not cancel my subscription because... That's no way to register your um, disagreement. You should write them and say, we disagree with you. What's a, what's a catwalk video, Desiree, for the COVID? Tell me and I'll do it. Is that something you did? I'll do it. I meant Adam Curry. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> he may. That may be the guy. Let's search. Who invented podcasting, right? One of those weird questions. Who invented podcasting? Adam Curry and Dave Weiner. Dave Weiner did the software, right, that that allows RSS feeds to uh, encapsulate um, a link to the, to the actual podcast. Adam Curry and Dave Weiner. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I'm getting all my misspeaks corrected. It's good. <laughs> A uh, question about Peter Ward, who contends that ice caps melting would not kill humans, but stagnant waters will lead to microbials that will end human life. 
that's just how does he know that so there's no way that peter ward knows that this is going to happen he's speculating he's speculating that there are a lot of bacteria frozen in the ice and their massive release first of all the ice is melting slowly right it's clearly melting. It's not going to melt overnight and dump all these bacteria into the ocean. So it's melting slowly, and the bacteria are going in. Most of them are dead, and they're being turned over. So what is the problem? Mike Peter Ward. You know, people like to say these things just to scare people and get attention. Yeah, he's got lots of videos about that. Uh, the flooded earth. I think there are a lot more serious problems to worry about than uh, the microbes. I'm not sure they would be stagnant either. Tonus says, Peter Hotez did a good job on WNYC radio. Okay, so I, I'm fine. I'm fine with Peter Hotez. He says, you know, we need to bring scientists forward and defend them, blah, blah, blah. And he doesn't even mention all these podcasts we do doing exactly that okay because it's not his idea he didn't do it so he just wants you to listen to his idea pay attention to him so I, i'm a little offended by that because peter is on the board of parasites without borders he knows we do a lot of podcasts why can't he say there is a group making efforts to increase scientists communicating why doesn't he do that so i i emailed him i heard he was in new york a week from monday back so I said, I emailed, I said, hey, come to the incubator if you have time. We can do a podcast and we can talk about this, right? Scientists communicating. I get, a, I get an auto email. I get a lot of emails. Please contact my administrator. You know, I get a lot of emails too. I, answer, I don't answer them all, but I look at them. I don't think that's an excuse. I don't care if you get a billion emails. Do something about it. Don't have, your, your admin can't answer a billion emails, so. <laughs> hmm... Uh, Hans writes, uh, Vincent, uh, if Flubi Yamagata is extinct, should the vaccine need to be trivalent in the future or should it remain tetravalent? And is the natural extinction of a virus unprecedented? Yeah, so we have, uh, let, let's look at the current vac flu vaccine composition for the 2023, we have two influenza A, of course, and two uh, influenza B viruses. And, um, you know, for many years it was trivalent, and they added uh, the second influenza B virus. So right now we have a, a, a Victoria and a Yamagata lineage. Yeah. I would leave it tetravalent because there's no harm. And we, we don't know if the virus is somewhere where we're not sampling, right? So I would give it some time. I don't know how long you'd want to do that, for five years or 10 years or so. Is natural extinction of a virus unprecedented? So, you know, we haven't been... <laughs> we haven't been uh, sampling like we do now for very long, right? 20 years maybe. So I don't know any other example in the past 20 years of natural extinction. Um, so I would say probably it's happened many times, but we just didn't know it because we weren't sampling. So I, I don't think it's unprecedented. I think viruses come and go and lots of factors can control whether they no longer are able to reproduce or not. For example... Um, if the lack of a host, if a virus has a specific host and the, the host goes extinct, then the virus is going to go with it and so forth. So I would say it's not unprecedented. Nope. Nope. If Paxlovid prevents viral reproduction, does it diminish the learning of the immune system? Less exposure to the virus. Okay, so we answered this last week, right? So the, the question is how much antigen is produced to educate the immune system and whether it's your first exposure or a second one, right? So if it's a second or more exposure, you have a memory response, which 
may need less antigen than a primary response. We did a paper on TWIV uh, some time ago, which I believe said that the that Paxlovid is not affecting um, immune response. Let's see if I can find it very quickly. Uh, an, ex an explanation for SARS-CoV-2 rebound after Paxlovid. This is the problem. It's a bioarchive article. <laughs> okay, so... Um, whether uh, the, so in this one study, which is an NIH study, they found that whether you took Paxlovid or not, people who had COVID made antibodies equally fast. So in other words, um, here we go. The um, Paxlovid is not stifling the immune response. So and this was done in the context of COVID rebound to find out if that was part of it, but it's not. And this is a published paper. Um, this is an NIH article, if you want to look at it. So uh, I don't think that it's stifling uh, the immune response, no. But it's a good question. You got caught by the change. Well, I guess ours changed a while ago, right? <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you didn't miss it. <laughs> Every week, a recent study found COVID patients exhale up to 1,000 copies of virus per minute during the first eight days. That eight days is probably a mean, so some would be exhaling longer. Yeah, some are shorter, right? Um, and 1,000 copies per minute, uh, we don't know how many of those are infectious. So I think it means nothing. Maybe one copy is infectious. Who knows? And you know what? It's going to vary from person to person. So measure infectious virus. Don't measure copies. I don't know why people think that measuring RNA copies is going to tell you anything. I don't get it. Measure infectious virus. Now, you may say, okay, this is why you transmit. Yeah, I mean, it's a respiratory virus. It's transmitted by exhaling droplets that contain virus. But if you want to know how much people are exhaling, you need to measure infectivity. You know, because this ratio of RNA to infectivity changes depending on the variant. So you can't just measure it. It's not good. <laughs> Every week for two hours if you're not tired. I'm okay. I get invigorated when I'm in your presence all of you, I got, we had almost 200 people tonight. This is awesome for a pretty, what shall I say, geeky live subject, live stream. So I'm invigorated. I get home, I do this, do a little more work, go to bed. I'm good. I am good. <laughs> With the option for Vincent to call an audible. You know, if there are questions, I'm not going to call an audible because I love to answer your questions. I just love it. You can ask for as much as you want. If you said, Vincent, we want four hours. Or let's say we have a new outbreak at some point, which we're going to have. You want three hours? No problem. I'm at your service. I'm here to teach you, folks. That's, that's my existence. And it's a great existence, believe me. Isn't it COVID rebound rather than Paxlovid? Yeah. Patricia gets it. Patricia gets it. Now, why don't docs get it? I don't understand. Maybe they go to meetings <laughs> and in a vacuum and nobody's read any papers. And a few of them say, yeah, I had this patient treated with Paxlovid and they got rebounding. Yeah, oh, I had that too. Oh, we better not use Paxlovid anymore. Is that how this, this works? That's bad. It's not the way it's supposed to work. Is it true that no randomized control studies were done for the new COVID vaccine? No, they did. We we mentioned it last week. They had 50 immunized and 50 control. Yep. And, and, and another version of this question is someone said, is it true it was only studied in mice? Said, no, it's been studied in people. My doc actually asked me that. <laughs> That's very funny. Hello, Dr. Tanya Bro Shropshire from New Orleans. How are you? It's good to see you again. And um, so another question 
on Paxlovid rebound. We already addressed that enough, I think. Uh, it's great that you do this. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. It is my passion to do this for you. Like my doc said uh, when I went to see him, I said, are you going to retire? He said, no, it's, it's my privilege to do this. And I like that attitude, right? People feel it's a privilege to do whatever they're doing. Kelly App, I was catching up on your TWIV. There was a question on the missing Wuhan data from a website. Uh, I don't know what you what you mean here. Um, I, I don't remember. So if we did this on TWIV, I can assure you there's nothing to it, most likely. So I know that at one point, sequence data were taken down from a website, but then they were returned. Okay, so in the end, nothing is missing, and it, it was of no significance. Yeah. Uh, Beth, I had no idea how to search TWIV on this. I had three original vaccines for COVID-19. I was planning to boost mid-September since I'm traveling November. I just got COVID-19 and took Paxlovid. How long should I wait before getting vaccinated? Oh, what does Daniel say? When you feel better. I can ask him. Send it to me, please. Daniel at microbe.tv. And we'll put it on the list for tomorrow. Okay. Um, I just got COVID. How long should I wait to get vaccinated? Uh, because Daniel talks about that all the time. You know, the CDC says one thing. Let's look it up. Yeah, what the CDC says. <laughs> So the CDC, there's no recommended waiting period between getting a vaccine and other vaccines. Okay, that's different. I'm sorry. Um, 10 days, at least 10 days after your illness to get vaccinated. So that's not bad. That's what the CDC says, Beth. So uh, you're probably just recovering. So may, wait till you feel better, which is going to be 10 to 15 days most likely. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Griffin said three months uh, a while ago, but... Um, this is CDC recommendation. But if you want Dr. Griffin to weigh in, uh, Beth, that's totally fine. I, it's Vincent at microbe.tv. Michael wants to know where, where Amy is. Amy's okay. She can't do this anymore. <laughs> I was going to say, she's a government employee, but the government's going to shut down, right? Uh, but I, I think she won't be able to do it during the shutdown. Um, so, yes, Amy is um, not doing this anymore, sadly, because I really enjoyed having Amy. So now it's just office hours. How do you feel uh, the implementing the same genes that have been introduced into mosquitoes to sterilize them for breeding for other dangerous insects? I have the pine bark beetle in mind, the deforestation. So... Well, what they do is they put Wolbachia into the mosquitoes, a, a, a bacterium, and that effectively sterilizes them. It doesn't quite do that, but it's a similar effect, right? It makes mating not work. And that's been extensively tested, and um, it seems to be safe, right? It's just going to get rid of those mosquitoes in a certain area that are disease-bearing. It's not going to spread globally. They've looked at at the penetration of the Wolbachia. It doesn't get very far. So I, my feeling is that's good. Now, for other insects, it would have to be tested. I don't see why not. You know, uh, a, a good fraction of in, I think half of the insects in the world have Wolbachia endosymbionts, and so a lot don't. So this pine bark beetle could be a candidate. Um, let's see if people are doing it. Pine, bark, beetle, uh, Wolbachia. Yeah, here we screen the, oh, this is cool. We screen the pine bark beetle for uh, these um, infections. So, yeah, they don't have Wolbachia, so they could be introduced in them. So they test it in a lab and do that. Yeah. I think it would it would work, yeah. Uh, 
I suppose naming is semantics. Well, no, it's it's not because it happens without Paxlovid, so it's not really re Paxlovid rebound. Prevalence of experiencing it. Uh, that's a good question. How how many people get the inflammatory phase? Ten, according to uh, this particular website, about ten to twenty percent. Sonia Gandhi, right? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> Dr. Gandhi says she thinks that the course of Paxlovid isn't long enough and you, you stop just short and then you get a little more replication. I don't think there's evidence for that, but the course of Paxlovid is pretty short. Yeah, that, maybe it should have been seven days, yeah. So, oh, you want to know, just wait till you feel better. Yeah, if you're better on Paxlovid in six, seven days, then you could get it then. But, you know, you're going to have lingering. I, I remember I, had, I took Paxlovid and you have lingering sniffles and so forth for 10 days or so. Do you think there are people out there who will never get infected? or maybe just never get a symptomatic. So there's certainly people who will never get a symptomatic infection. They have, you know, there, there are a number of reasons why you would do that. One of them is you have a certain HLA allele that protects you in conjunction with an earlier uh, co uh, common cold coronavirus infection. And um, that they get asymptomatic infections, or if you have high interferon, you can get asymptomatic infections. Uh, are there people that will never get infected? That's really tough to know, right? I mean, there are people in all parts of the world that are pretty remote and don't have a lot of contact with other people. I I think, you know, no no infectious agent infects a hundred percent of the population. It's just close to that. There are always people that are going to escape it for whatever reason. They may not even have a. They may not have an asymptomatic. They may have no infection. They may be resistant for any number of reasons. We, you know, it would be lovely to find them and study them. Why? But um, that's really hard to do. But it's a great question. So here we are. We're about halfway through the questions, and it's nine o'clock. So you can see we're going to go for an hour tonight, which is totally fine. And I don't want to discourage your questions at all. They're great, but I don't think we're going to get through all of them. <laughs> interesting how hospitals are bringing back universal masking in some places so i think a hospital is a, a special place and that that should happen because there are vulnerable patients there that you want to protect so i think it's a good idea to do that especially if if uh, cases of covid are peaking i don't have a problem with that you know if i wouldn't object well, I would never object to anyone asking me to put a mask on. If that's what they want to do in their facility, that's fine. But this makes perfect sense to me, right? Five shots, infection, got long COVID. Beneficial to get new va the, the new vaccine or enough antibodies from infection last April to wait and skip it. I don't know anything about your, your age and comorbidities, but according to Paul Offit, who's a, an MD, he said, if you're over 75, you should get this new vaccine. If you have health problems that predispose to severe COVID, like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, asthma, you should get it. But if you are under 75 and if you're healthy, it's up to you. You don't need it. And, you know, we don't, we don't check. We don't check for antibodies because we don't know what they mean. So that's not going to help. So that's what I think. All right, Patricia, uh, your other question. Did, I don't know if I answered your first one. Did I? All right. Hope if I didn't, just just ask it again. My other question is about vaccination. He, hearing Hoffitt say we need to monitor effects 
of vaccine ten to year, five years, five to ten years from now is a bit jarring. I must admit because I thought most negative effects show up in the first two weeks. Yeah, I agree. They do, and um, but we will, we will keep monitoring. Right? There's post licensure monitoring, and you can't not do it. You have to do that. So can you think of any uh, adverse effect of a vaccine that showed up five to ten years after the vaccine was licensed? So you know the the polio, the the uh, cutter incident happened within weeks. Um, the myocarditis, the blood clotting for COVID vaccines that happened uh, within a year. What, am I, what else? I, I can't think of any. If anyone can think of one, please let me know. I agree that um, the things usually happen initially. I guess he's thinking, well, maybe there's something we don't know about that could happen in five to ten years. But, you know, for all vaccines, we monitor anyway. So I don't think it's an issue. So Good question. Uh, are the human data for the new vaccine? So what there are are antibody levels in 50 people who were immunized <clears throat> and 50 people um, who who got uh, control, which was saline. And they looked at antibody induction and they looked at the ability of those antibodies to neutralize currently circulating variants, the alpha, various alpha subvariants. And they say that they have significant levels of neutralizing antibodies against all of them. That's what we know. We don't know anything about protection. That's a good question, Wanda. Right? I, I would love to know that. Um, but more importantly, so you're going to have protection. When you get this new vaccine, you're going to have protection for a couple of months because your antibody levels are going to rise, right? Um, and, and so you'll have high antibodies in the, in the uh, mucosal layers of your upper respiratory tract. And that'll really dampen infection. It's not going to block infection, but it will dampen it so that you won't, you, you won't get mild disease. It will protect you for three months against mild disease. But then I'd like to know after those three months, or how long is it then that you start to get not mild disease, but moderate disease, which means that now your memory, you're depending on a memory production of antibodies to get protection. So it's going to take a few days. The virus is going to reproduce and it's going to have a head start before the antibodies and the T cells kick in. When is that going to happen? I'm sure it will be just like all the other vaccines. Three months or so, the protection will, will drop and um, you'll get more, more severe disease. So that's what this is doing. It is protecting you for three months against moderate to severe disease. You, it's protecting you against mild disease. And so... <clears throat> That's the question. Is that worth it for everyone? But actually, we have to see if it even does that. That's the assumption because it's inducing neutralizing antibodies, right? <clears throat> uh, my hospital requires a mask for persons with respiratory symptoms. Makes perfect sense. On a previous TWIV, you spoke about how getting the COVID booster will help decrease spread of the virus and protect the community. Isn't this alone good reason to get the jab? If, in fact, it does that, right? That remains to be seen. And it really will depend on how many people get it, right? So if 50% of the population get it, there will not be any chance of having that effect. And I don't know what the number would have to be. But... Yeah, if if in fact did that, and there aren't great data that that actually happens. In theory, it should, because as I just said, I just said to you, it's going to decrease the amount of virus replication, so it's going to decrease shedding. So it should do that, but we actually don't know. We don't have data on it. So you you would say, why not error on the um, on the positive side, just in case it would protect. Yeah, I just don't think there's 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 data to even suggest that it would happen. And I think that's what Paul is thinking too. Mm. It's a good question. 
every week will help us keep track and keep coming back do it however long because we don't want you to overdo it no i with viruses i never overdo it even when they infect me i don't overdo it i'm good <laughs> hmm Yeah, I'm sure there are people here who have not been ever infected as far as they know. Well, they, I bet there are people who don't have ever had COVID, right, disease. And how can you say you've never been infected unless you do an antibody test and you show you don't have antibodies to nuclear capsid protein, right? Because you're going to have antibodies to spike if you've been vaccinated. So if you have antibodies to nuclear capsid, which is not present in the vaccine, then you've been infected. But I doubt many people have had that check. But if you have, let us know. We'd like to uh, hear it, yeah. Uh, let's see, Sam, oh, he's talking to Peter. Okay, so he's not talking to me, okay. Um, with respect to Ender... End roots question. Any evidence of retrovirus appropriated a previous cellular protein? Yeah, it's the syncytial protein, but he wanted to know or she wanted to know if it was a um, muscle, you know, the, the muscle fused muscle cells could be a, a retroviral protein. I'm not aware of any evidence. <laughs> Throwing my name idea in the ring for the wastewater testing segment. Scoop on the poop. That's very good. I like that. I like it. Yeah, we should do a wastewater testing episode, and we'll call it the scoop on the poop, and I think, yeah, people will like that. <laughs> if you knock the stream to an hour, you won't have time to show us toys and talk about other things. It's true. I... I think it's going to be two hours. and But, you know, people are free to leave after an hour, obviously. You can leave whenever you want. Um, you know, by the way, speaking of leaving, uh, we have 200 people and 150 likes. So please hit the like button. I appreciate you hitting the like button because it maybe gets other people to come here. Uh, did you see that Jimmy Dore was exposed to taking $5,000 a week from billionaire to make anti-vax YouTube content. I don't know if um, Desiree is still here, but what do you think of that? Do you know anything about that, Desiree? She's, I think she's gone. I haven't seen her in a while. By the way, she put on her Instagram that she had nine and a half pairs of shoes for $10,000. They're all Christian Louboutins. Anyway, I didn't know that, Mike. But this is how the anti-vax uh, industry works. They pay to, to get people to do that, right? Can you imagine? They would pay me big bucks, right, to say nasty thing. I would never do that. But, you know, can make a lot of money. But I'm not interested. I only want to tell the truth, folks. I'm not purloinable. Is that the right word? Our English major folks here, am I not purloinable? I don't think purloin is right, but you let me know. <laughs> um, hey, the Joe Rogan model of three hours. Well, we did once, and people stayed. So if people are interested, they'll stay for three hours. You know, And if it's interesting enough and not droning, if I had a guest for an hour, yeah, it would all work. I could have three guests for an hour each. We could do a Tonight Show, right, with Vincent Racaniello. The virus show, the late night virus show. People would come. The Tonight Show used to begin at 11, right? Yes, the incubator address is 352 7th Avenue, Suite 703. But the zip, you need the zip 10001. What a great zip code, right? <laughs> One of the best zip codes in the country. Not because of anything I did. I just, I just happened to rent there. So, yes, 10001. Um, Desiree, thank you so much for your contribution to science communication. What a what a nice gesture! I appreciate it. And also, Kip and Laura, thank you um, for your contribution to science communication. 
Paxlovid effectiveness recently is less so compared to original trials because there's so much immunity out there. It is, I'm not aware of the decline. Daniel has cited recent studies. Please, let's send me an email, uh, Kip, Vincent at microbe.tv, saying this question. I'll put it to Daniel tomorrow, okay? Hmm. Dax says, long COVID seems to have similar symptoms like fibromyalgia or other autoimmune diseases. Any viral component to any of these? Well, you know, the, the long COVID, um, um, ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, CFS, they have a viral trigger often. So obviously long COVID has a viral trigger. That's quite clear. And ME-CFS, perhaps of a diverse viral triggers, including Epstein-Barr virus, right? The paper that we're going to do on TWIV uh, Friday makes some connection between Epstein-Barr uh, virus and, and long COVID. So um, I don't think it's, a, it's an autoimmune phenomenon. I think it's an inflammatory phenomenon. Um, but, you know, we'll... we'll I don't think that study implies autoimmunity is, is part of the issue. But as I said, you know, there are many different components to these post-acute sequelae of infection, and I think they're going to be different for sure. There is an no article, Novel Human Endogenous Retroviral Protein Inhibits Cell-Cell Fusion. What fitness advantage would inhibiting syncytial activity give a virus? Well, it could prevent other retroviruses from infecting the same cell, right? So it prevents cell cell fusion, but in fact, it would also prevent virus cell fusion. And so that could prevent viruses from super... So let's say there's a retrovirus in a cell, and now that retrovirus... Uh, mm, how can I say it without being anthropomorphic? That retrovirus most efficiently reproduces when there's not another retrovirus in the same cell. So it makes an inhibitor of fusion that prevents the other retrovirus from getting into the cell. That's what I would think that's for, okay? And if we search, well, we could search for it, but let's see. A novel human endogenous retroviral protein, protein inhibits cell cell fusion. Let's see if I can pick it up that way. Yeah, here it is, 2013. A novel human endogenous retroviral protein inhibits cell-cell fusion. Suppressin, they call it. Hmm. The first, it's a host cell encoded protein that inhibits cell fusion in mammals. It's, it's retroviral derived, that's right, and placenta specific. Hmm, placenta specific. So maybe in some cases, um, so this is a cell protein, right? So throw away everything I just said. Throw it out because it's all wrong. It has to do with cell processes. It's a way of regulating cell, cell fusion, not virus. It has nothing to do with the virus. It's left over from the virus, okay? There you go. Tona, you remember this. Three hours with A and V, two hours of A and V, and then one hour with me, right? So Amy needed to go eat, and I just stuck around for another hour. Yep. Okay. Uh, Elena from Coxsackie came down with symptomatic COVID, mostly horrible muscle aches and fever, took Paxlovid, felt immediately better, a data point of one but zero regrets. Yeah, I... I Felt better the next day. And 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 Doreen has the same experience. And many people, Paxlovid eliminates symptoms very quickly. It's quite quite effective. Yeah. Could I bring Ralph Barrick on? <laughs> I could, because you know, Ralph was on very early in the pandemic. And um I haven't had him on in a long time. I decided to leave him alone. And he doesn't do interviews. Ralph 
Barrick. We could certainly have him on to tell us what he's thinking. And, you know, he just published a paper on a pangolin SARS-CoV-2 like virus. Quite nice paper. We might do it one of these weeks. You know, I I try not to pick two SARS-CoV-2 papers for the TWIV, right? We do a snippet and a regular paper. So I have for this Friday snippet the long COVID paper from Iwasaki. And I'm really needing to find a non <laughs> SARS CoV two paper. I have a I think a dengue paper which is quite interesting, but we'll see if it makes the cut. You know, here it is Wednesday. So tomorrow I'm gonna have to pick this paper and, and then people you know, I always worry that people need to get them early, but then they read them the, the day of the show. So I shouldn't worry about it. But yes, we can bring Ralph Barrick on. I wrote it down. It's been three weeks since the first positive test. I'm feeling 100%. Everyone is different, but I hope my singular story helps. Thank you, Alina. What's crazy is if we had listened to people like Vincent before SARS-CoV-2, we have had Paxlovid ready and saved a ton of lives. Well, I think we should have been developing antivirals uh, after SARS-1, right? That would be broadly reactive. We could certainly do that, but we didn't. A variety of reasons. Too bad. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya, for your contribution to science communication. Really appreciate it. Hello, Steph. I thought you were there at the top. Maybe not. Well, thank you for moderating again. And thank you for your contribution to science communication. Some think that in New Zealand we had terrible lockdowns, etc., when we were living free and easy for a long time. Would you consider talking to Dr. Michael Baker, Professor Sir David Skegg, or Dr. Ashley Bloomfield about the um, process in New Zealand? I will write the names down. The only problem is, you know, the time difference. A lot of people don't want to do it because of that. Sir David Skig and Ashley, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield. Yeah. I will look up what they're doing and think about doing that. Thank you, Ian, for your contribution. Instagrams to follow. There you go. There's Microbe TV and me. So we have two channels. You know, Microbe TV has all the official announcements. And my channel also has all the official announcements. But then it has stuff from me when I go on trips. I take pictures. We did a cool thing today. <laughs> so before we recorded a sickening, me and Jerry and Karen. So Jerry's the other part of the sickening she's the science journalist and then karen's our studio assistant we sat down and brainstormed and i recorded it because there's some funny parts so we'll let you folks see it maybe we'll put it on on patreon it's getting covid a second time worse i think it depends on the person you know some people it's it's milder because you have immunity and for others it's worse because they have an inflammatory disease that makes it worse um, you're 58. You've have you got it once? And you've got three vaccines. You have any comorbidities? So pull off. It says if you're under 75 and you're healthy, you don't need it. But if you're worried about long COVID, you should get it because a lot of people that's the key for them. They don't want to get long COVID, and you know there's not a lot of evidence that after so many doses. It's going to help against long COVID, but if, if, you know, it's not, it's never black and white. So if you're worried about long COVID, get it. When ritonavir came out in the 90s, we were told it was specific to HIV protease. But now it's being used for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so it was originally designed as a HIV protease inhibitor. But then it turned out to inhibit... SIP3A. Okay, let me, oh, let me, 
get the right sip. So it is um, a cell protein that is involved in metabolizing drugs. And so it was found um, that ritonavir inhibited uh, that protein which is involved in drug turnover. So in other words, it increases the half-life of a variety of drugs that are turned over by CYP3A. Okay, so CYP3A is a cell protein uh, that metabolizes drugs, degrades them. So ritonavir is an inhibitor, so it makes your drug last longer. So that's why ritonavir is used in other formulations to make those drugs last, lo last longer. It's not actually hitting the SARS-CoV-2 protease. It's inhibiting this cellular protein CYP3A, and it's preventing it from degrading um, Paxlovid. Because right? otherwise Paxlovid would, would go over pretty quickly. So there you go. It's an interesting story. Uh, John writes, the post-viral replication early inflammatory phase always sounds like the most dangerous one for people having a severe result. Yes. And, and part of the natural pathology. Not everyone gets that, right? Question for everyone, how can we better explain the mRNA vaccine technology in such a way that the general public both understands it and is no longer fearful of it? It has to be explained using analogies. Uh, it's a good question. You know, it has to be... Well, Tom says they're artificial retroviruses. They're not artificial retroviruses, okay? There's no reverse transcriptase in them. It's just mRNA. And we're full of mRNA. So Desiree, if you're still here, you may not be. Yeah, you are here. Yeah, I see you. Um, has to involve part that our cells are full of mRNA. So we're not giving us anything that we don't already have. It just happens to code for a viral protein, right? So that has to be part of it, I think. But let's hear what others have to say. Uh, we shouldn't use the term sterilizing immunity. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it made people worry, right? Um, all right, now my, my, here we go. Where are we? Tona. Yeah, don't use sterilizing immunity. Do I shed enough to infect someone else? We don't know because nobody has properly quantified infectious virus shedding enough to know how much needs to be shed because as you know yes to infect a person is going to vary depending on the person there's going to be a range we don't know what the range is we don't know what the range that shed is so shedding is going to have a range not only with time but among people and how much it takes to infect someone else is going to have a range and we just don't know anything you read is just hand waving because people generally don't measure infectious virus So, darn, this thing pops around. I was just seeing it. Here we go, Beth. <laughs> I hit Beth and then the thing, it laid in the chat for some reason. When I click on one of you, the chat pops around. And so... Well, any of this is the question. When you take Paglov, if it fights virus for you, do you make as much antibodies? No. You make as much antibodies as without. That's what the, the study I just quoted uh, tells us. You make as much, so it's not dampening your immune response. Okay, there's that. Thanks, Vincent. But I also must have reproduction again in the second phase because the test signal skyrocketed again. Peter, I know it makes sense, right? We don't, we don't measure it, so we don't know. And I can imagine that there's some protein hidden somewhere and suddenly it gets released, and now you see a bolus of virus uh, protein going up. So you just don't know. You just don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, it, there was a good one here. Um, <laughs> where is it? Oh, a very fancy way to walk a straight line. Okay. Thank you. That's a catwalk. So that's what I have to do in my shoes. 
Okie dokie. I'm sorry about me losing things. Um, okay, here we go. Given the choice between Michael Minnit and Daniel Griffin's opinion, I go with Daniel every time if it's about a medical issue. Okie dokie. Okay, here's another good one. How about a calendar featuring each area of your TWIV network? Yeah, we could do that, but with people who are involved, right? Yeah, we could do that, and with the people involved, and then a couple with me. Thank you, Beth, for your contribution. Really appreciate it to Science Communication. Uh, silent runner got RSV and flu vaccine yesterday, felt crappy, headache, muscle aches. Today I'm all better. So this is a typical reaction. Yeah, it's an inflammatory reaction to the vaccines, headache, muscle aches. These are all um, typical inflammatory, nonspecific symptoms, and then you can't sleep because of that, right? But now you're good. I'm glad you're good. A fun one, how to understand likely health outcomes in infection if infection risk is cumulative or at least any infection has risks. I've seen time spans charted to the point we all have significant disease burden. So, you know, this is really interesting because I heard a talk <clears throat> and at, at uh, ESCV in Milan by Peter Oppenshaw, and, and I have to get him on, where he showed a graph showing that people with who have more respiratory virus infections, and these could be influenza, uh, RSV, and many others, they tend to have a shorter lifespan. So that, that's maybe the cumulative effect of many infections. That's the first time I've ever seen something like that, right? So I know you're, you're talking about infection risk, but the, the mere fact of being reinfected seems to impact your, your longevity. And why that is in certain people is a really good question. What other viruses it does as well really interesting yeah if you couldn't teach science what would you teach but well, i don't know anything else that's the problem well it's not a problem <laughs> because i could teach science but you mean in my current position right if i couldn't teach science but i still knew a lot of science and had to find something else I don't know anything well enough to teach it. I'm effective at my teaching because I'm teaching about viruses that I've done for 40 years, I've, I've thought about for 40 years. Now, I can understand other areas. So when I do TWIM with the microbiologists, I can listen to them explain stuff and then explain it back and ask good questions and teach in that way. But I don't think I could teach anything else. No, it's kind of sad, isn't it, Tona? I can't teach winemaking or beer making. I can't teach podcasting because I don't think I'm good enough to teach it. I'm good enough to make podcasts, but, you know, I, I train people <laughs> to do podcasts, to make them and edit them, but I probably shouldn't. Leo, thank you for your contribution. Uh, Leo, I, I just put your wine on a rack <laughs> at the incubator that you sent oh, last year, I guess. We still have it there. Haven't had an occasion to drink it. But thank you for your contribution to science communication. Amy is out shopping for cashmere. Yes, Amy does like them. I wonder if Amy can join as a guest and talk about sweaters and cake. Well, I think that would be a poor use of her skills, right? End root. What are some tips for reading scientific papers? I follow along on some, but sometimes I feel lost, especially when the more basic papers, often from the 50s and 60s involved, are behind paywalls. Oh, so you feel that you need to, to read the basic ones to understand the current ones, right? Well, that makes perfect sense. Well, you know, if the people are still around, you could, you could try and get preprints, although the 50s and 60s, you're not going to get anything you have to go to the library and xerox them well identify what it is you're having trouble with if it's a method or an approach if it's a background maybe you can find it in a textbook um, 
but uh, I, I, I don't, I, you know, Googling it may help as well, but find, try and identify what it is that's confusing you and then maybe go and, and read up on that. But yeah, it's a problem when you can't get to the original literature, but they should be explaining it sufficiently for you to understand, right? A lot of people feel that this wave was their first infection. I don't think we can, you know, go on our feelings, right? We have to have data. As far as I know, I've never had COVID. I know almost no one personally who can say that. Well, you didn't have symptomatic, right? Yeah. Either I have not gotten COVID or if I have, it's been asymptomatic. Yeah, probably. Good night, Lise. Thanks for coming. There are people who are incapable of catching HIV. Okay, Peter. So these are people with um, uh, CCR5 deletions, the co-receptor for HIV. And, you know, 4 to 16% of the human population have that mutation. It's not clear if it was selected by bubonic plague. That was a theory, but as far as I know, that was discounted, and no one knows why there's a deletion in a certain percentage of the human population. Not clear. Oh, so Tryon wants to know, why are we injecting, uh, you know, mRNA vaccines and not giving bacteria that can produce viral epitopes? Well, so people are looking into that. It just wasn't ready quickly enough for COVID. We needed to get something out there, and the mRNA technology was ready and saved a lot of lives. So I think that was great. If you stratify your patients carefully, you will find long COVID data is not as messy as you indicate. One needs to do a bit of homework. As you know, people don't even know how to use Paxlovid. Oh, yes. If you stratify according to condition, I agree. Totally agree. But if you just lump them all in, then it gets, it gets messy. But, yes, you're absolutely right about that. SRR, thank you for your contribution to science communication. We haven't heard from Michael Minna since he left academia for industry. Maybe you can get him on a TWIV. Michael is pissed at me. And he'll probably never come on TWIV again because I... He made a comment that I didn't think was good and I called him out on Twitter and he said, why are you shaming me on Twitter? I said, okay, you're right. I shouldn't shame people. I just said, you know, what's wrong with this statement? And he said, I should have made it anonymous. Okay, so he got mad at me. Now, you should forgive me. Because other people, have, like Marion Koopman's got mad at me about a MPOX paper that she published. And she got over it, obviously. She came on <laughs> to with. I don't know if Michael would. I have a feeling he'd be mad. He's an he's a emotional guy. <laughs> I thought Daniel said vaccination too soon after COVID infection may be detrimental because it can interfere with somatic hypermutation. That's correct. Yeah, you got the, um, the the lymphocytes, the lymph nodes doing their thing, and then suddenly you have a new bolus coming in. So I agree, except, you know, the official explanation is, um, the, the official timing is now shorter. So, as I said, send that question to Daniel. I want to see if he's still with the three months. And if so, because I do remember him saying that. But I also, when I looked it up on the CDC site, they said 10 days. So, I never have had symptomatic disease, but I am not complacent. I am complacent. I, I am very complacent. I just mix with everybody. I have no problem being in big crowds. I am a human being. And I, I occupy the earth with other humans. And I talk to everyone if I could, but most people don't want to talk to me because most people think strangers are weird and you shouldn't talk to them. But in fact, I would talk about viruses and stuff. But a week before the vaccines became available, I went through my house 
it went through my house. I decided to get vaccinated anyway because of microbe TV and don't regret it. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> how probably how probably do you think there's life out there? Don't I'm the wrong person to ask. I don't think there's anything out there. And um, a lot of people say you're you're full of it because there's so many p- planets and systems that there has to be. All right. I don't know anything about astrophysics, about planets, about space. Nothing. Don't know anything about it. So don't listen to me. I think it's unlikely, but we'll never know. How are we going to know? We can't go there. Sundari says the pharmacies here are all out of COVID vaccines. Oh, that's amazing. I wonder why. I guess people are getting vaccinated. But your mom got RSV and flu. That's great. She'll be happy about that. I'm in the Ceramune study. Every six months I take blood. They test for antibody to over 50 epitopes. My N is at the boundary where they say not sure if infection. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a level where you can't tell, right? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yes, I am. No, I do not. Yes, I'm here. I don't know this guy who gets paid, but she will look into it. I just thought you'd be interested because another example of, uh, you know, it's a big industry and the money is concentrated into a small group of wealthy individuals. Desiree knows about the anti-vax industry. Uh, VR can't be bought. No, you're not buying me. Nope. If you said... Uh, speak out against vaccines and we'll give $10 million to Microbe TV. Nope, not happening. But people would be dumb to do that, right? Because they know I wouldn't do it. But I would turn down $10 million for Microbe TV. I, I only speak the truth. Not interested in money. And, you know, people accuse me of being a shill and being paid by Big Pharma. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And Professor Vincent is not corruptible. Nope. If I ever win the lottery, I'll buy you some Louboutin too and give you the startup capital for your science communication company. Thank you so much, Desiree. I make a crappy heart, but here it is for you. All right. Thank you so much. And the finger hearts. Yeah, I hope you win the lottery. Uh, Louboutin doesn't make men's shoes, right? Maybe he does. What do I know? Um, thank you. I would appreciate it. If anyone else wins the lottery, please uh, boost um, our company. Jessica, when you're in New York, please visit. Yeah, you love the um, the incubator. It's a fun place. People um, uh, have a good time when they come. Liz just Liz just visited, and uh, she had a good time. Uh, people people watch six hours of someone driving around in the rain looking for storms so we can watch Vincent for two hours. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. But, you know, you are a, a, a really special group of people who, who want to learn. I think you meant I can't be bought. Purloin implies that something is stolen. Okay. I kind of like the word in that context, but thank you for correcting me. Thank you, Will, for your contribution to science communication really appreciate it and i'm sorry to highlight all these things that say good things about me even since integrity can't be stolen or bought it's true you're not gonna buy me out and they don't even try no none of these anti-vaxxers have ever uh, approached me they know better um I wonder if you didn't get long COVID by 2023 or if, if you're less likely to develop it from future SARS-CoV-2 infections. So it's a good question because we don't see long COVID from uh, cur- seasonal coronaviruses, right? Although we, we don't know if they ever did cause any kind of long COVID, but it's possible. We'll see, right? We will see. Hello, Richard. Good to see you again. Always nice to have you here. Hope you enjoy my lighting. Well, it hasn't changed in a long time. We do change the lighting at the incubator. I got one of these rectangular soft boxes that shines just almost right down on me and it throws a nice light on me. Uh, didn't Ralph Barrick have COVID when he was on Twiv? I don't remember that, but you know, it's a long time. 
So I don't know. Yeah, Paxlovid. Um, <clears throat> all right, so antivirus for flu. So there is a newer one, a newish one. Uh, back, uh, what is it called? Um, <laughs> Baloxavir, which is really good. One dose gets rid of virus reproduction. Bob Krug wrote in to us. Bob Krug discovered the, the target for um, Baloxavir. And so he, he said it works really well. And I asked Daniel, do you ever prescribe it? And he said, no. So it's not a well-known drug, but it's a good flu antiviral. Okay. Ashley, Ashley, let's see, is that Ashley Bloomfield? Yeah, I got her name written down here. We'll, we'll look into it. Uh, let's get you to commit to a 2024 calendar. We have three months. We're committed, okay? I will get the rest of the team to commit to a calendar. If uh, you you need 12 nice photos, right? If you want to email me, you have my email. Now that I l understand things from listening to TWIV, I really wish more science was on microbiology and public health was towards antivirals. We're trying to be more broadly listened to. And, um, you know, it's hard. We... <laughs> Not a lot of people want to listen to hard science. They want to listen to, they want to watch people chasing storms. So I'm, I'm not giving up. I'll be here until I can't talk anymore. And then um, I hope the, the company will go on way beyond me and keep doing this good work. Yep. Are you saying to avoid long COVID, we should get boosted every six months? No, I'm not, actually. So John, uh, Peter, Paul Offit thought that the protection against long COVID, COVID decreases with each booster. And so there's diminishing returns. But many people are afraid to get long COVID. And if they want to be vaccinated for that, go ahead. But it's, no, it's not clear that it will help. Remember the TWIV on Paxlovid? That was a good one. Yeah, they had to work hard to get that original one. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, commenting on any TWIV upload also affects the algorithm. Besides thumbs up, remind people to throw a thanks comment so the algorithm will bring th TWIV to more people's fees. I didn't know that. So just say thank you or love it. Now I understand why people say every week, great stuff, right? I say, oh, why do they do that every week? It's the algorithm. So feed the beast, folks. Leave a comment. Say, you know, underneath the video, even this one or any of the other posts would appreciate it. Just go and say thank you for this. The mRNA vaccine simply does one part of what the virus does anyway. The virus causes the cell to make mRNA, which causes the cell to make spike. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, exactly right. So if you don't want the mRNA vaccine, you're going to get infected and you're going to get spike mRNA anyway. So you might as well protect against the bad effects of infection, right? The idea that mRNA vaccines have something to do with retroviruses is a misunderstanding that anti-vaccine people have seized. I know MDs who have encountered this issue. That was the problem because the early papers came out saying it was reverse transcribed and integrated, and from that, people thought it was a retrovirus. It's just uh, a problem. I agree. Uh, I don't think you made the chat jump around. No, uh, towards the end, or anyone who donates, it jumps around. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I'd rather have it jump around and you donate because we we can use your donations. I appreciate it. I think it's a really good idea to tap the pool of previous TWIV guests into office hours. That would be an opportunity to all. That's a great idea. You know, if they're willing, because um, it would be fun to get Paul off it on, right? Just for an hour. We could get him on, I think, 8 to 9 p.m. So that's a good idea. I will work on that for sure. I totally will work on it. You see, we went for two hours. 
Mike, how much of the SARS-2 genome is understood? Well, the protein coding regions is not are not completely understood, right? Uh, the spike is the best understood. Then the polymerase is, is understood to a certain extent. A few of the accessory proteins, but nucleocapsid structurally, many are not in the non-coding regions, not really. I mean, they're involved in in signaling during replication and so forth. But people tend to not work on those those issues. They tend to work on uh, vaccines, immunity, pathogenesis, and so forth. My mother turned 100. I'm not aware that she's had any respiratory infection this last four years. Oh, my gosh, we need to sequence her genome. We need to get a little bit of blood and sequence her genome. That would be cool. Do I recommend the new dengue vaccine, Kidanga? I'm sorry, I can't recommend it because I haven't. Well, well, Takeda just pulled their FDA filing for it, okay? <laughs> they have some data disagreements. So um, you can't get it uh, in the U.S. at the moment. So no, I can't. I can't recommend it knowing that, right? Is SARS-CoV-2 a seasonal respiratory virus? Well, we don't have uh, an idea what the season is yet, right? We think it's more prevalent in winter, but as you see, it's happening all year round. We think it eventually will become a seasonal respiratory virus, most likely in the winter and temperate climates, but we just don't know. All right, let's see here. We're going to wrap this up. Here, well, let's see. A student at Texas Tech was just put on research on Malditoff. Is the Malditoff used in virology research? Um, it's it's a basically a mass spec, and I think um, Tom answered this here. Malditoff can be important for protein analysis. Yeah, it's basically a mass spectrometer, and uh, you can do protein analysis in it. It's also used to diagnose bacteria to identify bacteria but yeah many people um i use it to study viral proteins in, in fact in particular the anacristea at princeton uses it extensively to study viral proteins i had her on years ago and i have to have her back she's a lot of fun thank you beth uh, I'll, I'll check it out I'll give it to uh, daniel and thank you for the nature immunology paper tremendous uh, let's uh, wrap this up <laughs> at one billion. No, even a billion dollars. I will not. You cannot corrupt me for a billion dollars. You can call me crazy, um, but I would not be corrupted for a billion dollars. It doesn't even appeal to me to to corrupt myself for that kind of money. Even though you could do amazing things with that, not happening. Could we do an episode on role of membraneless organelles on virus replication? Sure. Let me write that down. Membraneless organelles. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yeah, take the money <laughs> and <laughs> say the opposite of what they want you to say. Look, I mean, I'm doing a series of podcasts for Pfizer and they wanted to pay me, and I said no, and it wouldn't be that much money, right? We're not talking of millions of dollars, right? A few, a few thousand dollars. No, I don't want it. I don't want you to pay me to say anything. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate. I do have honesty. I have some expertise, and I try and share it uh, with all of you. Um, and so that's what this is all about. All right, let's see if there's anyone else to thank here for um, contributions. Seems to, uh, you cannot corrupt me. Yes, you can't. Not even with good wine, okay? Can't corrupt me with good wine, good food. It's just not happening. Office hours should be open house. Tell previous TWIF participants that you do it and they're free to listen and join. Oh, that's an interesting. You could just say there's a standing invitation every Wednesday night. Here's the link if you want to join us. But, you know, knowing scientists, they won't come. 
they they need to have a special invitation just for them. So I don't think that's going to happen. All right, folks, we have uh, 200 thumbs ups. We had 200 people here tonight. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. And if you can put a comment in the um, in the comments of any of our TWIV uh, videos. And uh, I want to thank our our uh, moderators for tonight. We had uh, Andrew. Uh, we have Steph. We have uh, Tom. We had Frank up at the beginning. We had Andrew. I already mentioned Andrew. Steph, I mentioned. Vanity Nutrition. Uh, Les was here. Uh, even though he said he wouldn't make it, he came anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Les. Maybe you're sitting at your event and uh, watching it on your phone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll be back here next week. Who knows? Maybe I can talk a previous guest uh, into coming. You won't know until I post the thumbnail. That'll be Wednesday. What is Wednesday's date? Today's the 27th. That'll be, oh, Wednesday, October 4th. That's it for September, folks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, in the meantime, until next week, please be safe. Love you all. Good night.